So this is the THX AAA 789 headphone amplifier from Mastrop. It was originally released back in 2018 for 350 bucks and it shattered the mid-fi bar. With its new AAA technology from THX, it boasted some of the best measurements we've ever seen at any price point. And more importantly, it sounded great. Everyone was clamoring for one. Mass Drop was sold out for months and struggled to keep up with demand. As soon as one hit the used market, it usually sold out at or above the retail price and it was gone within minutes of being posted. Mass Drop ended up raising the price to $400 and demand was still sky high with the amp being sold out most of the time. Um, but here we are in 2021 and I can go to Drop's page right now and see that they're in stock for $299. What a time to be alive. So what happened since? With its spectacular measurements and rock bottom price, why are people looking elsewhere and willing to spend even more money on other units? That's what we're here to find out. With us today, we have some Class A monsters, the acclaimed new Linearity King, the interesting and eclectic choices with a stellar pedigree, and an American underdog story. This video is loaded with amps. Considering the stakes and the subjectivity of it all, I didn't think it would be enough to get just one person's take on things, so I invited some local friends to bring their own headphones and give these a listen as well. So which one of these deserves your attention? Let's find out. Quick shout out to Zinsonics for being able to build this high quality, completely passive 10 source switcher on such short notice. I love the craftsmanship on this thing. Check out their site for other accessories and top quality headphone cables. The Drop THX AAA789 headphone amplifier comes from a partnership between hobby enthusiast retailer Drop.com and audio standards body THX. Though development for achromatic audio amplifier technology began in 2006, it wasn't until 2018 that the headphone community was able to hear it through the Mass Drop 789. Combining highly efficient Class B topology with a new feed-forward design, Drop's THX amp was a breakthrough in the budget fi audio world. So let's just dive into the sound. Um, you can consider this a reference amp. It's just completely uncolored. It's super transparent. It reveals seemingly everything. Uh, it's extremely enjoyable for critical listening at low and medium volumes, which I really appreciated. If you're coming from something like a noisy amp or a pair of Bluetooth headphones, this level of transparency and precision, coupled with what seems like a bottomless noise floor, it actually may be shocking to you at first. It's just that clean. For this price range, it takes clarity to the upper echelon of what you thought was possible in headphone listening, which is why it was such a hit. It's garbage in, garbage out, with nothing added or taken away. And something to note here, it's not as warm or expressive as some of the other amps that we're gonna talk about, but it's not meant to be. THX amps are no-nonsense, super transparent units that are meant to disappear so you're listening to the source with the least bit of coloration as possible. That said, the bass is nice and punchy here, more so than the A90, which helps keep things interesting without much use of an EQ. And to be honest with you, I don't want to spend too much time on this amp since we have so many to talk about. Plus, there's so many other existing reviews on the 789 here, so let's quickly go through the pros and cons before moving on. Start with the pros top tier resolve and transparency. It really doesn't get much better than this. It has a great low end and actually some pretty decent uh, bass slam. The price, it's only $299, probably one of the best amps you can get at that price point. And the footprint, I love the size of it. It's not too big, it lays comfortably on your desk. So as for the cons here, it can sound a bit analytical. And what does that mean exactly? We're actually gonna talk about that more and dive deeper into it when we get into the A90. So I'll hold off on that con for now. So as for my overall thoughts or conclusion on this, uh, basically what you've heard is true. This really is as clean and as quiet as they come. Big kudos to Drop and THX for creating such a linear amp at such an accessible price. So let's move on to another famously clean amp, the Topping A90. Topping A90 
，更是一个桂冠争夺者。冠军只有一个。So while the THX AAA amps are based on THX's feed-forward error correction technology, the A90 uses something called NFCA, which stands for Nested Feedback Composite Amplifier. Other manufacturers have used similar tech, such as JDS Labs. And if you've heard a JDS amp, you know how clean the sound is. Basically, it's a topology similar to THX's, as that its main goal is clear and uncolored, pure amplification, pushing to eliminate noise and other artifacts. Add this design with Topping's push for sonic excellence, along with a decent price point, and you could see why many would call this amp the new linearity king. So on first listen, the sound is more or less like the THX789 here. It's clean and pure, with a super black background, meaning uh, that bottomless noise floor that I talked about earlier, when things are supposed to be quiet, it's actually really super quiet. Uh, and upon further critical listening to the A90, though, I felt like there was a slight organic nature to the sound when comparing to this. Songs felt like they were opening up more, and things would feel a tad more alive or more natural. The sound stage is a tad bit wider. Songs feel bigger in scope. And while I likened the 789 signature to one with razor sharp precision, the A90 doesn't feel as sharp, but the sense of clarity is still very much there. So on the THX amp, you get this well-defined focus on each instrument which seemingly creates the sense of intimate detail. Every note has a great level of precision and elements feel more forward and in your face, creating a more narrow soundstage. While at times I like this effect, I do have to note there is a slight loss of realism and holographics, meaning the THX amp tends to make things sound smaller, slightly less refined, and in the end more artificial compared to the topping here. And this to me is where the A90 picks up where the 789 left off adding a touch more realism with an increase in lifelike imaging to its overall sound signature. Listening to classical or jazz um, with many instruments playing simultaneously, and the A90 sorts that out with a bit more refinement, better scope, giving more spatial coherence to a guitar playing, or even feeling the reverb better on a human voice so you know what kind of venue that they're in. And that all said, all of our listening preferences are still very much subjective, and I actually found myself preferring vocals on, on the 789 on many occasions. The way the THX amp gives voices more attention and brings that part of the song to the forefront for increased intimacy, it would keep me more engaged. So the big question is, if you're one of the lucky people that nabbed the Drop 789, should you upgrade to the A9 to hear? It depends how much you like measurements and that crystal clear sound from these amps, the A90 definitely takes it to a higher level, but if you ask me, it's kind of more of the same. If someone handed me 500 bucks to upgrade to something else, I'm a little bit more adventurous. I would look at one of the other amps here to maybe try out a different sound signature entirely. Uh, the guy that I bought the A90 from here, he mentioned that he was only selling it because he wanted a warmer sound. If you're in that boat, then you should listen on. So overall, I'd have to give the nod to the A90 for its more engaging and more realistic sounding presentation. You get every inch and more of that glorious resolution and transparency while getting a sense of a more natural sound signature that's not as analytical as the THX amp. So now let's go over the pros and cons of the topping A90. Let's start with the pros. Top-notch transparency, it has an endless noise floor. It is one of the few amps here with a balanced Pentacon connector, which I really appreciate. Is this ever gonna replace cumbersome four pin XLR? Time will tell. Now as for the cons, this, the power cable. Look at this little thing. It's, I measured it, it's a little over three feet. Topping an SMSL must have the same exact IEC cable supplier because they are always way too short. I mean, at this point, why even include it? It's just bad for the environment. But I don't know, maybe you can use something like this. Also, a super thin volume knob. It's, it's nice and smooth, but I, I hate it. It feels like I'm taking my fingers and it's like a pair of tweezers and I'm trying to like get it exactly. I, I mean, it does the job, but it is the worst ergonomically among the other units in this showdown. Feel free to geek out here and replace it with an aftermarket knob, which you can get on Amazon or some other place. So my conclusion here, with its more lifelike presentation and higher end specs and functionality, I would also crown the topping A90 as the new linearity king under $500. Okay, onto the test bench. So the purpose of this part is to kind of isolate these amps, or I guess class of amps, in this case, the transparent amps, 
uh, away from the other ones and just to say, okay, it sounds good with these headphones in particular, and maybe just give you some tips and tricks on, on what to mate it with. I also have two different DACs here, the Aries 2 and the Chord Cutest, you know, Delta Sigma versus R2R. And as for headphones, I have four Planars and three Dynamics and one IEM, the Blonde BO3. I'm not a big IEM guy, but I figured it's, it's good to have one around just to see how it sounds and if uh, these are particularly noisy with IEMs. The good news is IEMs, at least the one I have, the Blonde BO3, the cheapy, it sounds amazing with these. Dead, silent noise floor, as you can imagine. These are just super quiet to begin with and super transparent, and it sounds, it sounds great. I have no problems running IEMs through these two transparent amps. Um, the one I did not like, the, the headphone I did not like particularly was this one, the HT6XX, just because I know it's capable of so much more. Uh, throwing it on the Jot 2 or the, the uh, SA1, it was much more preferable with these amps. And same can be said with the Verite. Uh, it sounds good, but I know it sounds better. I've heard it sound much better. Now, now you want to take a look at a headphone like this, very analytical, bright headphone. Uh, so it said, the HT800S. And this, these are very neutral, super analytical amps. And it's, it's quite often said that that's not a great pairing. The game changer for me was going into the DSP, Runes DSP, and choosing the convolution filter and getting Oratory's EQ settings for this. And it kind of tames those super analytical highs and makes the mids uh, pop out a little bit more. Against all odds, I actually really like the HD100S uh, with this. It wasn't my favorite headphone, but it was better than I thought it would be. As for planars, I mean, they all sound great. What what can you say? I mean, Am Empyrean sounds great. This sounded much better than expected. I actually think this was a better pairing with the transparent amps than the Aria. Um, just because I know what the Aria is capable of and this is even more analytical and bright than, than the Sundar. The Sundar has spectacular treble, and it made it nicely with the, the transparent amps here. And this, the, the little headphone that could, it's just such an amazing headphone, as I said before, but you get oratory settings for it, and it just really shines here. And it's super transparent. Um, the highs are just crystal clear, and, and I love that pairing as well. Last thing I'll mention, THX versus Topping here, but electronic music, I love it on the, on this, the THX amp. It's, it's so precise and then just so quick and speedy, and then the bass is a little bit elevated. It, it's really fun with the THX. Topping, uh, again, but it is better for jazz and acoustic music. Guitars, I, I much prefer on the topping. Um, they, they sound close, but it's just the little things, and the little thing for me was electronic on this, and acoustic and jazz on this. For whatever reason, I cannot find my footage of the DAC comparisons here, but the quick of it is, although the cutest was excellent at showing off the transients with these super transparent amps, and it was fun to listen to, in the end, I actually much prefer the Denifrip series to just that smoother, um, mid-range rich presentation made it better with these amps. So before we get into other amps, let's address the big question many people have. If the Drop 789 and the A90 measure so amazingly well and sound so clean, why should you look elsewhere? One could argue that while those amps are super transparent and are true to the recording, they may not be true to how you prefer your music to sound, whether it's a certain level of warmth, a wider sound stage, or what have you. There are many different dimensions of what audio geeks may consider musical enjoyment. While transparency to the recording is one such dimension, it's not the only one. So with that, let's move on to... The Jotunheim 2 was released in 2020 and is the second iteration of an already bodaciously popular amp. In this gnarly edition, Jason Stoddard completely revamped the internals to produce even better specs and sound. All Shite products are hand-built in sunny California or their new facility based in Corpus Christi, Texas. Texas? yeah. That's right, partners. The good old boys are happy to lend a helping hand to you city slickers out west. Yee! The best part of all is the feature-loaded Jot 2 stays at the same rock-bottom price of $3.99. How about them apples, folks? <laughs> Y'all come back now. You hear? So this is the second iteration of the Odenheim, and so much went into it. 
Reading directly from Stoddard's announcement here, we have Scheidt's Nexus and Continuity S technologies. Mesh with super matched parts throughout, a whole new linear power supply with much lower noise, higher power output, lower distortion, better performance, switchable preamp outputs. I'll link to the announcement in the description where he gushes over the process to make it, and it's actually a very fun read. So I have to start with the price. I cannot believe this is only $400. The sound is very clean and resolving, but unlike the linear amps before it, it has more personality, has punch and warmth. The elevated mid bass and mid forward presentation, coupled with the authoritative power, provides this lovely feeling of fullness. If you're a bass head, you'll be very happy with the Jot too. Plentiful and well controlled low end with a punch, Crank up the lower frequencies on your EQ of choice, and it's a very fun time with pop and electronic. And I, and I have to say this, but the warm sound, while very fun, on the top end, I have to say it leans slightly dry, with less decay and less sparkle up top. And there is a bit of harshness with the S's, but that's something I'm fairly sensitive to. The song City Love by John Mayer, at about one minute, he says, she steals my clothes to wear to work. The S's here are a bit more sizzly and grating than on the A90. It doesn't ruin the whole experience, but it's something worth noting for the Jot too. And this is not a forgiving amp. If there are issues with a recording, it will expose them more than the Class A options, which we'll talk about after this one. And the sound stage feels like it's right in the middle. It's not narrow or noticeably wide, it's just neutral. When comparing directly to the A90 here, I start to appreciate the added flavor or character the amp provides. It's more subtle than going from the Linearity King to one of the Class A amps, but it's still a welcome difference from the analytical first sound signature. The song Sophia by Clero has this fun little hook at two minutes and 32 seconds with multiple female vocal singing. And while I get a crystal clear presentation from the Jot 2, I really prefer the tiny bit of reverb added from the Class A amps. It adds this bit of softness, this longing or expressive element to it, whereas the Jot can feel a bit sharper around the edges. And to me, this is a prime example of where I'd say being extremely clean may actually turn into a negative, but I fully know that uh, that's subjective and you may actually prefer the stunning speed and clarity here. It's because of this that I can't really say that this is a con, but more of a matter of personal preference. And earlier I noted the sound is a bit dry. Many times I want the vocals to open up more and be a bit more airy. They don't get to that level and this causes things in this range to sound a tad veiled comparatively and it lacks that added spacious dimension of other amps. But in the end, the enjoyment level from the Jotunheim 2 far exceeds the gripes, especially at the price point. So pros and cons, start with the pros, the engagement factor here. It's not the most clear up top. Uh, everything else though is very well defined and most of it all is very enjoyable. The warmth, the capabilities it has, and the power make it hard to find faults here. And also let's quickly talk about the volume knob. It's an Alps blue velvet volume knob. It's super smooth, uh, has really good resistance. I like it a lot. It's one of the best here, though it's not as smooth as the monolith amps. And lastly, the last pro, the value. For under $400 with an optional uh, DAC module, there really isn't anything I can harp on that will make me say you should not buy this amp. I really wish this existed years ago when I first got an NFB 11. And let's go through the cons. Um, although the sound is powerful here, it's not as refined or as expressive as the other amps in this roundup. I had slight issues with timbre, things didn't sound as realistic or natural as I'd like. And the power switch, it's on the back, kind of a pain in the butt. And lastly, it's a continuous problem with all shite products, but the hieroglyphics on the toggles on the front. I always forget what they do or what they mean, you know, you don't usually touch these, but when you're first getting this amp and trying to figure out what it means, it's, it's always a learning process. So to sum up, for $400, it's hard not to recommend the fun and punchy, yet detailed Jotunheim 2. This was actually a big hit at the audio meetup that I held. Everyone unanimously loved it. It can drive just about everything, and it sounds clean and engaging to boot. All right, we got the Jotunheim 2 on the test bench here, and with a bunch of different headphones. Out of all these, my daily drivers Meze Empyrean and the Jotunheim 2. So good together. Uh, I complained about dryness on the top end here. This kind of smooths that out. And it's not the most resolving headphone. I'll get into that in the future review, but 
it just made so well with the 092. I, I loved it. It's power to spare and it's just clean and, and punchy. Uh, going through the list, the Verite, it was second best. You know, it's, it's also an expensive headphone. So, you know, it usually sounds good with everything, but it really sounded good with the Ode 9 2 as well. And between these two DACs, uh, if you like fullness, the Aries 2 all the way. If you want some sparkly top end, go with the cutest for headphones such as the HDXX here. I'm sorry, HD6XX here. <laughs> I gotta tell you, with the Aries 2, it was pretty mesmerizing. The forward sounding nature of the Aries plus the forward sounding Yot 9 2, it was just a great mix. I forgot how good the HD6XX sounds, and I, I always wonder why you keep it around, and then I plug it into something like this, and it's just a great combination all, all the way, and I don't think I'll ever get rid of these. Uh, also, running down the list here, the Sundaras that sounded excellent. Um, not as sparkly on the top end as these other two the Aria and the HD800S. But yeah, the Aria, probably one of the most popular headphones now. I preferred it with the Aries 2 and the Jotunheim. It's, uh, this is not a very mid-forward headphone. So the Aries 2 with its mid-forward presentation plus the Jotunheim 2, it kind of made up for that. And that was my go-to setup for the Aria. For this headphone in particular, the treble was just, it sounds so right and just Hard to explain, hard to put in words, but the convolution filter oratory settings with this headphone and uh, the Yod 9 2, I would use the Aries 2 or the Cutis, it sounded great with either. Uh, as for IEMs, you know, if you've been doing research on the Yod 9 2, here's my blonde BLO3s. They're not high end by any means, but the amount of noise and hiss coming from the Yod 9 2, even in low gain mode, it was insane. Uh, I think I've read people using attenuators to help control that. But out of all the amps I tested, the Jotunheim 2, for me, it wasn't the best choice for IEMs, so keep that in mind. But yeah, in the end, Meze's Jotunheim 2, you don't typically see a $400 amp with a $3,000 headphone, but if you need a second amp or you, know, you typically use tubes for this, this is a great solid state option. So now let's talk about the amp everyone's been clamoring for, the Singer SA1. Yang 虽然Singsar之前一直供不应求 So aside from an interesting digital-to-digital -digital converter, I didn't really consider Singzer a big player in the head amp space. So let's just dive into the sound, but the initial feeling here is one of clean and transparent sound, similar to the Drop 789 and the Topping A90. But like the Yod 9 2, we have the addition of some personality here. Whether you call that distortion or simply increased decay, the result is very interesting. While the really linear amps here give ultimate transparency and precision to instruments, the Singzer will lay those notes on with this alluring grace. Sounds hang around a hair longer with more prominence, and this overall effect feels like instruments have this sweet and engaging euphonic presence on the SA-1. The soundstage feels a tad wider, coupled with a liquidy, smooth upper mids that Class A tends to provide. This, this though, almost does it too much. Strumming guitars and piano are a real joy on the SA-1. The song Don't Know Why by Nora Jones has both instruments and those extra microseconds of decay give them this wonderfully euphonic presence, which is really pleasing to hear. When talking about higher frequencies, the SA-1 is very competent here as well. It doesn't feel harsh and I get every bit of information that I'd want to from things like cymbal crashes and snare hits, listening to the rest of John Mayer's Room for Squares album, along with electronic and pop songs, the overall effect sounds both very sweet and engaging. The SA-1 distances itself from overly ear-splitting dynamics, 
which makes for a very pleasant listening experience. And I can't stress how good the SA-1 is at doing this. Most amps in this price range tend to struggle to find the right balance of top-end sparkle without being too harsh on the ears for longer listening sessions. And this to me was one of the standout qualities of this amp. As for the soundstage compared to the other amps here, the SA-1, despite that lush Class A sound signature, it doesn't stage as wide as I thought it would be. It's one step wider than the neutral Jotunheim 2. So while the instruments feel close, they're not as intimate as the transparent amps. If I had to compare, I'd say it's like you're sitting in the first five to 10 rows of a live venue with this versus sitting in the first row or with the band on the stage making the music. As for speed and precision, other amps such as the Flux models and the Burst and Soloist beat the SA-1 here. As glorious as it sounds, that ever so slight and relaxed timing affects how quick instruments such as a violin can stop on a dime. This is something you may not even notice or care for unless you're A-being to another amp. But I found this worth mentioning because when it came to classical, I would actually prefer some of the other amps in this lineup. Another thing to point out is when I crank the volume on the SA-1, it delivers. The extra power sent to my headphone feels effortless, it never struggles, it feels clean, and it gives me the same level of dynamics and clarity across the spectrum. All this is a sign of a well-built amp. So while the bass impact is just so-so, the way the bass hits you, the extension is most definitely there. It may not feel as big and engulfing as other models, but the definition down low was surprisingly cream of the crop. Vocals can feel a tad thin on the SA-1 when you're directly comparing it to the Jotunheim 2 and the Soloist. I initially thought this was in my head, but going back and forth, especially with female vocals, this trait became more and more apparent. And then, someone else from the meet actually mentioned the same exact thing, that comparatively, the sound signature from the Singzer felt slightly thin. The sweet and engaging euphonics were still very much there, but we felt something else was missing or just not up to par when comparing to something like the Jotunheim 2. I decided to do a deeper dive comparing this aspect to every other amp here, and what I concluded was, although the SA-1 is fairly competent in the lower mid to mid bass region, it was lacking a bit of bite or authority here. Take a song like 10 out of 10 by Troy Sivan, just listening to the solo guitar at the beginning of the song shows noticeably more body and fullness on the Burson or the Jotunheim. When Troy's voice comes on, amps such as the THX and A90 were more transparent, letting you hear every inch of reverb with the greatest detail. So while you get the ultimate in transparency and clarity from the measurement monsters, you get the body and emotion from the other amps. The SA-1 sort of sits somewhere closer to the transparent amps here. As odd as it sounds, the SA-1 is rich and enveloping, showing qualities of Class A, but at times I'd miss that full and expressive body in the lower mids from the other options. This happened with both the cutest via single-ended connection and the Aries 2 with the balanced one. Another song, Save Me by Muse. At 39 seconds, the bass guitar comes on, followed by some synthesized strings. This sounds absolutely wonderful on any of these amps. But the same thing happens. What you get with the Jotunheim 2 is this full and warm, satisfying feeling. The SA-1 sounds more like the A90 here, transparent and revealing, but without the body. And the last song I'll mention on this, Die With A Smile by FKJ. The timbre on the Jot 2 sounds more natural, and the more pronounced mid bass gives you that full sound. But the SA-1's better definition down low and wonderful portrayal of stringed instruments makes it Actually, to me, more enjoyable on Singzer's amp. That floaty, reverby, class A goodness is definitely there, and it's really fun to listen to. Okay, now let's bring up possibly the worst thing about this amp, um, but the unintuitive four-way switch gain toggle on the bottom of the unit. Who decided that? This is probably done as a cost-cutting measure, but is a complete pain in the butt. If you use IEMs and want to switch to something like a power-hungry Hi-Fi Man Aria with some convolution in Rune or some EQ, which brings down the volume even further, you have to use this. So if you plan on stacking this unit on something or putting something on top of it, just keep this in mind. And let's get into the nitpicks, but the volume knob, it's shallow like the A90 and not very finger-friendly, and your thumb may actually hit the XLR cable if you're outputting balanced here. Uh, People online have shown their knob rolling results, so that's something you can look into if you find that annoying. So toggling the high Z, low Z switch affects the output impedance, 
and does something to the sound, including the volume level, but the change isn't really that big. In my tests, the HD800S from Sennheiser exhibited the biggest sound change. On high Z, things sounded tighter with a smaller sound stage and with a bit more intimacy. In low Z, things sounded bigger, a bit looser, and also a bit less natural. Um, with the Verites, the same thing happened, but to much less of a discernible degree. Honestly, in either position, I still enjoy what I was hearing. They probably should have just made this a gain switch instead of the impedance toggle. So while I mentioned that I preferred the fullness from some other amps here, the fact of the matter is, whenever I would switch to the SA-1, it was always a pleasant experience. Within the first five seconds of listening to music on this amp, there's this comforting feeling that you get that you know you're in for a great time that's both pleasing and non-offensive. Maybe you'll disagree, but looking back at it all, I'd say the sum is still greater than its parts, and I'd still call this a very fun little amp. And one thing I have to mention too, I do have my little blonde BL-03 IEMs. I really preferred them on the SA-1 the most for a wide variety of genres. So pros and cons, the sound quality, we'll start with that. We have glorious Class A done in a very engaging manner. Um, also, the small footprint. It's a nice thing to just put on the desk. It's Heavy has some heft to it, and also it's flexibility. It has all the ports, Pentacon, uh, preamp outputs, you're good to go. So now let's go to the cons, the gain switch on the bottom of the unit, or switches, I should say. Also, it can feel a tad thin sounding versus full. It's a bit on the brighter side, so just keep that in mind. And I'd say the poor volume knob. So overall, if you value stellar measurements and like to hear every single detail while at the same time, you want something that's not as sharp as the super transparent amps, then the Singzer SA-1 could be your enjoyable path to Class A at a mid-fi price. So if you've been reading about the Singzer SA-1 online, you probably know that there's a DC mod where you can install a set of four jumper caps on a certain board within the unit, which contains a DC protection circuit. Doing so actually disables the circuit, and in addition to voiding your warranty, this could possibly kill your amp, your headphones, and maybe even harm you if your power source is unstable. I personally haven't heard of any horror stories just yet, but just know that if you do decide to go this route, it's at your own risk. The reason why people are doing this is for the upside, which is what many are claiming is a noticeable increase in sound quality. So let's test that for ourselves. Okay, not sure if anyone has done this yet, a B with a the jumper mod on the SA-1 compared to a stock one. Is there a difference? The answer is yes. Uh, there's a definite difference. Is it mind-blowingly different where everyone must do this mod? No. Um, if you're out of your warranty period and you want to, you know, experiment and, and see what the mod does, then yes, uh, I think it's, it's worth a try. So as for the differences, it's cleaner, clearer, it sounds fuller. So that kind of soft and smooth floaty sound from the stock SA-1, that characteristic gets decreased with the jumper mod. Uh, and to me, it's very much preferable. I, I like that it's it's fuller and it's cleaner. And you going back and forth, and I hate using this term here, but you may say this is thinly veiled, the stock version, do the, the jumper mod and things seem to pop out more uh, things are more forward, vocals are more noticeable, and it's, again, it's not night and day, it's not like a 50% change, it's more like a 10% change, let's say. Um, but, you know, you're, you're buying a $600 amp, a 10% change is very much welcome uh, if you're into this hobby. So keep all that in mind, and you do ruin the warranty once that happens, so, you know, it's a bit of a gamble, but I think you will like the results. So the big question is, how does it sound with the headphones? Headphone rig we got. Uh, in a word, great. Uh, everything that I threw at it sounded simply simply great. It was really hard to find fault overall. Um, everything from planars to dynamics to IEMs, there was no high noise floor. It sounded clean and clear. And I did mention in the transparent amp case that these dynamics here, uh, the Sennheiser and the Verite sounded a bit flat they seem to come more alive on the SA-1. It, it was more engaging, it, it felt more natural and organic. It's a bunch of terms and buzzwords I know, but I'm telling you, it, it was much more preferable on the SA-1 than it was on the transparent amps. Отже, ви вважаєте, що Україна слабка? 